This is the final lecture. In this lecture, we are all bringing it together to how everything it is, is decided in politics. We talked about the rules as laid out in the Constitution. We talked about how citizens can affect politics outside of elections, but it's now time for us to focus on the center of American political decision-making, political parties and elections. The most efficient way for citizens to impact and influence policies is through political parties. Now, what are political parties? They are a group of citizens united by ideology seeking control of government in order to promote their ideas and policies. This is different than civil society or interest groups where the interest is to influence politics but not necessarily seek control of government. So parties seek to place their members in positions of responsibility within the government. And what do parties do for us? Well, they offer political linkage. They link voters with elected officials, which enhances responsible government. Through the tool of the political party, voters have a direct, sometimes, link and voice to reach uh, elected representatives and hold them accountable. Uh, parties also help overcome fragmentation due to separation of powers. In the United States, the political system is very fragmented. Parties provide an overarching common attempt for members of the executive, judiciary, and legislature to work together. And of course, through partisanship, the support of opposition parties and opposition ideologies, they provide a voice for the opposition, which if it was forced to rely on individual members of the public rather than to organized parties will be very weak. Uh, some authoritarian regimes do not permit opposition parties, but they permit individual people to run on an opposition later because that provides a weak opposition. So parties help the opposition get organized and become stronger than it normally would be. Now, political uh, linkage is not easy. There is a model, a theoretical model, which provides four conditions that can help uh, promote political linkage. It's called the responsible party model. This is made up by one, a coherent set of programs consistent with ideology and different from those of other parties. Each party should have a different program that flows naturally from its ideology, its ideas about what good government and what good life mean. Candidates should pledge to support party platform and to implement their program if elected. Rational voting, voting for the uh, voters should vote for the party whose program most closely reflects their own ideas and hold elected candidates responsible when deviating from the program. Pro from the program, and three, the parties have mechanisms that hold elected members accountable. If all of these four characteristics exist, then uh, you. Uh, have a responsible party model, and you usually have as many parties as their ideologies. Now, this does not work well in the United States due to the separation of powers that undermines the ability of parties to hold members that, in, that are in government responsible, and also the personalism in elections, the fact that Americans focus on persons. It can also lead to too many parties. That can be a problem in many democracies. For example, Italy has that problem, and Israel. As this humorous uh, sketch from Monty Python's Life of Brian points out, the left especially has the bad habit of seeing a lot of fragmentation in its parties. So over the years, the more populist right also has that problem. Are you the Judean People's Front? Fuck off. What? Judean People's Front. Well, the People's Front of Judea. Judean yeah. People's Front. Come <laughs> wankers. Can I join your group? Now, piss off. I didn't want to sell this stuff. It's only a job. I hate the Romans as much as anybody. Are you sure? Oh, dead sure. I hate the Romans already. Listen, if you wanted to join the PFJ, you'd have to really hate the Romans. I do. Oh, yeah? How much? A lot. Right, you're in. Listen. The only people we ate more than the Romans are the fucking Judean people front. Yeah. 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 And the Judean popular people front. Oh, yeah. 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 Split yeah. Split yeah. Split and the people's front of Judea. Yeah. Splitters. Yeah. The people's front of Judea. Splitters. We're the people's front of Judea. Oh. I thought we were the popular front. People's front. Whatever that 
and put a pop in the front. Eh? He's over there. Yeah! To do electioneering, they recruit candidates, especially for local or well, not flashy positions, for example, city or county board member or board of regents member. Uh, it's easy to find people who want to run for president, member of the House of Representatives, senator, state senator, state assembly person, state governor. It's much harder to find people to run for local controller or uh, justice of the peace. So parties do a job in persuading people to run for those offices that are less flashy. Then parties nominate candidates, either using open or closed primaries. Primaries are essentially intra-party elections in which the members of the party and other people who are permitted participate in choosing between potential candidates to put one who will be support, uh, supported fully. We're going to talk about open and closed primaries much later on. Open primaries are the party uh, members plus uh, the general public. Closed primaries are just the party members. And finally, on helping uh, candidates run by nominating conventions for presidential candidates, by putting time and money into presenting the candidate and getting the party machine support that candidate. Parties also help define policy agendas by putting political issues and potential solutions of them to the public, by presenting them, by recommending them, and by running with them, and by getting candidates to pledge that they will go uh, and support this agenda when they, become, they come to power, and by essentially promoting the agenda in the media and the general public. So putting issues that were not before that into the awareness of the general public and the voters. But their most important role is to support candidates in general elections. In the United States in the past, their role was very important in this because they were the ones who would get people to vote and get in the candidates' message out. Parties had both money and membership, so they could get foots on the ground to get the story of the candidate throughout. With the media revolution, power moved from parties to candidates and from labor-intensive to capital-intensive campaigns. Uh, where candidates with a lot of money didn't need the members of the party to go and uh, canvas people on their behalf, they could just get on the TV. So the present role of parties to provide their services and raise money for the candidates, uh, which has made them less powerful. Now, how do they provide the services and raise money? In the 1990s, there was soft money. Unlimited contributions from donors could be given to the party, and then the party would act as a piggy bank and distribute that, uh, those funds to various candidates. This ended in 2002 by the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, which essentially put power in the hands of candidates. It makes completely sense that potential election candidates as members of the legislature would like to take power away from their parties. So it took power from the parties and gave it to the candidates. Nowadays, you can do contributions by political action committees. Since 2012, there can be unlimited contributions to super PACs by people as long as those are not officially provided to candidates or parties. This essentially means that candidates and parties cannot directly get money, but the super PACs can campaign on behalf of a candidate or a party independently. And as long as they do that, they can have as much money as they want. On the other hand, if you want to give money directly to a candidate or to a party, there are actually limits to that. Note, by the way, sometimes letting money speak is not bad. The end, the end of Jim Crow in Georgia was heavily reliant on the ability of Atlanta to use its financial clout to support uh, candidates that will oppose Jim Crow, Crow at the state and regional level. So, in a way, having money be so important in politics is a problem for democracy because it makes candidates beholden to the financial interests that support them, or it only makes independence possible for rich candidates. On the other hand, money is a way for minorities to have their voice heard in political systems where the majorities are against them. It's a condition. It's not something you can solve. It's something you can manage. How do parties spend their money? They spend them on targeted contests. They do not spend it on every contest that is being contested by candidates of the party. But where they have a chance of winning and where elected officials that belong to the party can come by and campaign in order to get more support for the candidates. For example, here is a couple of Senate districts in France, Senate District 16 and Senate District 18. 
Uh, in one of them, the District 16, the Democrats have a 50% chance of winning the election. The Republicans have a 37% chance of winning the election. In the other district, the Republicans have a 51% chance of winning the election. Democrats are 31% winning uh, chance of winning the election. The Democrats are not going to spend money on Senate District 16. They're going to try to raise their chances in Senate District 18. On the other hand, the Republicans are not going to spend uh, money on Senate District 18. They're going to spend their money on Senate District 16 in the hopes of raising their chances. So that is what it means to go to targeted contests. Some idea of how electioneering used to be can be understood from this clip from the brother from the movie Brother Where Are Two. It gives you an idea of the dynamics uh, of electioneering in the past. And gentlemen, here and listen at home, the great state of Mississippi. Happy old Daniel Governor. What to thank the soggy bottom boys? What a wonderful performance! <laughs> now, it looks like the only man in this great state who ain't a music lover is my esteemed opponent in the upcoming, Homer Stokes. <laughs> yeah, well, there ain't no cup of taste. It sounded to me like he was harboring some kind of hateful grudge against the soggy bottom boys on account of their rough and rowdy past. <laughs> looks like... Looks like... Homer Stokes is the kind of fellow who wants to cast the first stone. Well, I'm with you folks. I'm a forgive and forget Christian. And I say, if their rambunctiousness and misdemeanor is behind them... It is, ain't it, boys? Uh, yes, sir, it is. Well, then I say, by the power vested in me, these boys is hereby pardoned. <laughs> In the second Happy O'Daniel administration, these boys is going to be my brain trust. What's that mean, Everett? Well, the army's in you, and the infant and Tommy are going to be there. Power behind the throne, so to speak. Oh, okay. So without further ado, and by way of endorsing my candidacy, the soggy bottom boys is going to lead us all in a chorus of You Are My Sunshine. Thank you, boys. Governor, it's one of our favorites. You're going to go far. You are my sunshine. Parties are not there just for getting people elected. They're also about governing and controlling government, putting their people in important positions of government, coordinating the activity of those office holders around a specific agenda, especially across the three separated branches of government, executing the agenda, from organizing, supporting rallies to holding elected members responsible, essentially getting people to push uh, the legislators and the executive to put the agenda, to implement it, and then hold them re responsible if they don't. And this actually works. Repeated surveys by social scientists have shown that two-thirds of party promises tend to be implemented when a party controls the presidency. Not exactly the way people want, but in some possible way, in some way. So, Doing so forces accountability since voters can reward or punish a party for a failed agenda. So it's very important for parties to get things done because that is the basis on which voters, supposedly rational voters, will vote and will support a party or not. But as we're going to see, partisanship has largely to a part uh, taken away this rational voting model, especially for the activist minorities. Learn to appreciate parties for what they are. They're a way to organize disparate, many times incoherent ones into a policy agenda that can survive the political game. They're one of the few ways outside elections where you can impact politics in this country, and they're a way to get things done in a separation of power system. They're not ideal, they're not uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for democracy, but they help it. 
but they won't work if your citizens are apathetic and don't participate in partisanship in you know trying to be a part of a party uh influence the party agenda and so on if you just receive what party activists have done then you have nothing to say you have no right to say oh i'm unhappy with it if you're not active others will be lots of the things we talked about here generally apply to all political parties but let's spend some time now talking about specifically the u.s party system and what you see over there in the picture is a classical bandwagon which used to be how parties used to advertise and electioneer that's why it was used to be said jump into the bandwagon so the first thing you have to understand is that the united states party system is essentially a two-party system but those parties are actually confederations of multiple state parties there are essentially 50 republican parties 50 democratic parties each from one state and a number of third parties at state level that uh, cooperate with the local democratic or uh, state party the parties are hierarchical at the top is the national party represented by the republican national commission or the democratic national commission and then you have the state parties uh, where there are a lot of the party power is then you have the local parties the city the town the county party uh, representatives and then you have the party members local parties and party members make the bulk of the party and the electorate they provide the foot the feet uh, for the party and a lot of the law of the inter in, uh, party money the local party, state party, and national party are the party in government. They're made up essentially of the members of the party that hold positions of power. Now, the American party system is a two-party system, and there are four reasons for that. First of all, in the past, a lack of deep and enduring cleavages that would cut the population, the electorate, to multiple potential party populations. Uh, there are, of course, Americans that dislike each other and are deeply divided, but they are essentially the margin. The majority of Americans don't hate each other's guts that much that they would essentially run on different parties. Uh, there are none of the regional, ethnic, religious or historical cleavages that in Europe make it possible for multiple parties to survive in the same system. Second. Our parties are old. U.S. parties are very old compared to parties in the rest of the world, and thus hold population loyalty. They are adept at integrating new arrivals and new groups. The Democratic Party has been around in one form or another since the start of the Republic. The Republican Party has been around since 1861. They are old parties. Uh, and there are places, for example, Kansas, where people might vote against Republican policies, as they recently did, for example, on the question of abortion, but still vote for Republican candidates because of this deep identification with a specific party. Third, first past the post electoral system. The United States of America has a first past the post electoral system. That's a system in which the candidate that gets the most votes gets the position. Uh, and there's only one single position for every vote. This tends to foster two-party systems uh, compared to other systems like proportional representation systems where uh, positions in government are actually, uh, in the legislature especially, are essentially uh, a proportion based on the power and the number of elections and then the percentage of the electoral of the vote that the party got in the election. Finally, the two main parties, the Democratic and Republican Party, are adept at rigging the rules to make the life of third party candidates miserable, denying them media time, campaign money, and making registration rules that makes it harder, harder for third parties to establish themselves. Indeed, as this video can indicate, it can be tough to represent a third party in American politics. People are likely to think you're not completely okay. Hi, my name is Nancy, and I work with the International Socialist Organization, and I just want to start by saying... Oh, Lord.
if I can continue, I think there is also a problem in the analysis that I've seen in your works and that you presented tonight in the sense that I think we can tend to lose the forest for the trees, that you present so many, you know, astonishing details about what is wrong with the system and about what is wrong with the media that we can tend to lose sight of what I think the really key question is, which is why is this control necessary in the first place? And I would submit at least that I think it's because there's antagonist... I've got a minute and a half, I swear to God, it's no longer. It's because there's antagonistic interest involved. They didn't talk about about milkmaids and dairy, uh, you know, whatever it was, dairymaids and spinsters yeah. and laborers in the 17th century for no reason. It was because they were the working class. And what we see today in this country, I think, is quite frankly, let's speak bluntly, a ruling class which tries to control a working class population. And that's what it's about, is holding on to that power. If that's the case, then it seems like to me the question that we face is how to organize to change that system, to challenge capitalism. And I think in that effort, you do a disservice when you equate Lenin with Stalinism as blithely as you did tonight. That is an unquestioned assumption and also an easy applause getter we saw that you share with the mainstream media. And I think if it were actually that simple, the, co the horrific kinds of measures that even bourgeois historians describe as a counter-revolution under Stalin would not have been necessary if they were all the same to begin with. Now, in short, to sum up, what we're talking about is literally the fate of millions of lives around the world, particularly in the international politics that you describe. That being the case, then I think we need a full and a serious and a fair discussion of various different alternatives, not just talking about the horrors of capitalism, but actually how to change it to end this stuff once and for all. You don't know the first thing about communism. <laughs> no. <laughs> Other characteristics of the uh, American party system, the party, has become, the party system has become increasingly polarized from a period of moderation, especially uh, during the 1970s. Uh, there are two reasons for that. First of all, the public has become more polarized, especially the parts of the American electorate that belong to the activist fringes has increased in size compared to the past. And secondly, the primary system for deciding primary party candidates for the general election has permitted a lot more power to those fringes. Primary system essentially is a democratic system within parties where people, party members and anybody else permitted vote to choose uh, the candidates that the party will support in the general election from a wider array of candidates than before. This means that parties have lost a lot of their gatekeeping function which in the past tended to hit people who represented more radical, more fringe or more minority ideas. The other reasons is, the, the other characteristic is that the American party system is decentralized, the national party is strong, the state party is actually stronger than the national party because of better discipline, but the local party is weak. And the reason why the local party is weak is because the local party usually holds the weakest positions in government rather than compared to the state parties that holds and can take advantage of stronger positions of government. Most local elections in America are not really partisan. Uh, that actually is similar to many other places with uh, candidates of one party or the other winning with 90% of the vote or 85% of the vote or even just running against themselves. Polarization is also assisted by the weakness of party discipline in the United States compared to Europe. The decentralized system of party organization and the candidate-centered elections thanks to the media revolution undermine it, giving candidates the ability to essentially stand up to the party bosses and even run against the party. On the other hand, social and political polarization and fast past the post system tend to punish those candidates that are not able to have a lot of support in the party system. Now, generally speaking, compared to Europe, American members of uh, Congress, especially senators, have a lot more freedom from the parties. Uh, the idea of a member of the party being kicked out and excluded from the party is almost unknown uh, in the United States. Well, it's something that relatively often happens in European parliamentary party systems where the party has a lot of power uh, and controls essentially who can run as a candidate. The uh Seen integrated in this PowerPoint shows an example of polarization. Two members of opposing ideological factions almost come into fistcuffs with each other. Now, why are parties becoming more polarized? Partly this is because of who is active in party politics. Simply put, most people are not willing to spend scarce resources in time and money to engage in party politics, except if they are already interested in running for office or if they are persuaded that there is some issue at stake which is worth their money and time. 
party activists are drawn from this pool. This is uh, good in that parties are always fired up by energetic members that believe they have a stake in party victory. These members are also more likely to produce a coherent platform and spend the time and money to keep the party and government responsible. However, they also tend to be minorities, and the reason they tend to be fired up is because they believe that the majority is not interested enough in an issue close to their heart. This means that they tend to hold more extreme positions than the average Jessica or average Joe. Because of the time, money and emotional capital spent, they are also less willing to see their creation diluted by compromise. Consequently, the party base tends to want the party to represent as much as possible their preference for the state of the world. However, that version may be too extreme for the majority of the independent and moderate party voters whose support is needed to win elections. Nothing. That's okay. Let them film. Let them film. I'm happy to be on their website. Okay. That's okay. Let, let them film. That's okay. We are speaking the truth. They can tell their lies as much as they want. We'll keep telling the truth. This makes life hard for political candidates. To win party support, they must be more extreme than the average national voter, since the average, pa the average party member is more extreme. But to win elections, she or he or they must be more moderate than the average party member, since the average national voter is less extreme. This, however, means that they will have to a lie or misrepresent their actual positions, to betray the party members that spend time, money, and emotional resources to get them elected, three, betray the average voter who, as a majority, does get to demand that the ruler respect their moderate tendency. So when you're a party candidate, you're between the Skila and the Haribdis. To win the primary votes, you need to be close to the party center, which tends to be extremist or activist. But if you're too close to the party center, then you are going to turn away the moderates uh, during the general election who will vote for the other uh, side. So the key is to be extremist enough during the primary to win it and moderate enough that during the general election your stance during the primary is not going to come back and bite you, which is literally a skilda and charibdis. Good luck managing to get through that, but that is part of what you need to do in order to get uh, elected. But does this polarization actually mean anything? Aren't all the parties the same? This is a well-known attack on the American party system, especially by people who do not think that parties are representative enough of extreme minority views. And that is that the US parties really have no difference and offer the same platforms. While there have been periods of US history that this was the case, and while a two-party system tends to force moderation, the truth is that increasingly since the 1930s, and especially the 1970s, the two principal American parties do have important differences. The parties have party bases that have become, become increasingly differentiated ideologically. Conservatives tend to vote and be active in the Republican Party, and liberals and progressives in the Democratic Party. This ideological sorting has only become stronger over the years, uh, as powerful activist minorities in each party have moved the average ideological point of the party to the left or the right of the national average. Two, the members of the parties are increasingly different. Republicans tend to be more white, richer, older, and more often males. Democrats tend to be more racially diverse, poorer, and middle class, and are often more often women. Both are equally likely to be Protestant, with more Catholics, Jews, Muslims, and atheists in the Democratic Party. 
Third, the parties do have meaningful policy differences. To put it simply, they differ on policy positions, which, if implemented, will redistribute power and resources between groups on issues like abortion, gun rights, and voter, voter rights and taxes, and so on. The parties hold radically different positions that cannot be reconciled. The point is not the point is not even that they behave the same way when in power, like spending money, like spendthrifts. The point is that depending on who is in power, who picks up the tab and who gets the money is very different. Something you have to understand is that the increase in polarization in American political parties and the increase in differentiation ideology between them is a result of party democracy. Before the primary system, parties were dominated by party bosses and their machines. These powerful individuals controlled parties by being able to control who got the spoils of electoral victory, for example, the O'Hare family of mayors of Chicago. Before the civil service reform and the primary reform, these individuals and groups decided who will be supported by a party. Their party machines mobilized voters with promises of jobs when the party held political power under a system of patronage. They were good in organizing voters and getting them fired up. Sure, cheap ideological points were in use, ranging from racism, anti-Catholicism to the belief in the gold standard, but the main motivating factor was jobs. Consequently, elections had a huge turnout, about 80% in the 19th century. The happy times ended with civil service reform and the party primary system that put power back into the voters and the ordinary party members. Thus, while the party boss system meant that parties were less ideologically different than today, it did not mean better governance. But it did mean moderation sometimes in ideologies, simply because these people knew each other and knew how to compromise with each other. But they compromised by essentially using a spoil system that gave worse government uh, outcomes for American citizens. That said, the case of Nevada would caution against associating primaries necessarily with uh, polarization, especially to, to democratization of parties. You see, Nevada had a state legislature direct primary law since 1909 that mandated closed party primaries, where only voters that registered as party supporters can vote. But from 1908 to 1958, politics in Nevada were dominated by the party machines of George Wingfield and the McCarran Mueller Bleeds uh, uh, machine. So it's not always necessarily that democracy means polarization uh, and democracy means a weakening of machines. But maybe even after all of this lecture, you're still angry and don't like the party system. That's your right. So what can you do? First, you can try to create a third party, but these things tend to fail, except if they coincide with massive political events like the American Civil War. They tend to make an opening for the third party by fracturing one of the dominant parties. Or you can try to take control of a party. This is the way to do it. For example, the Tea Party took control of the Republican Party, later Trump took control of the Republican Party, and some will accuse that the progressives have taken control of the Democratic Party. This is not a sure way to succeed, especially if you are trying to take over the Democratic Party that is a bigger party and more diverse than the Republican Party, but it's the easiest way to essentially change the party system. Finally, you have to get involved, you have to become an activist, you have to participate in party politics, you have to spend money, time, and emotional capital of this, and of course, you have to vote in primaries. This is the ultimate weapon you have as a member of a party or as an independent voter in uh, forcing your own view on the party and maybe make it more moderate, more extremist. Vote in the primaries. Vote for the candidates you believe represent you better within the parties. In the America, you get things if you strive for them. If you're just waiting for them to fall on your lap, you're either a millionaire or you're a sucker. Now, looking at the history of the U.S. party system, we can notice the following, that it is dominated by periods of one-party dominance called party eras, broken by critical elections that saw realignments in parties. Critical elections represented popular reaction to seminal events causing realignment like the Civil War, the Great Depression, or the Civil Rights legislation. At other times, they follow long periods of de-alignment during which parties gradually break down, leading either to new parties to arise and replace the old parties, or to factions taking over the party and changing completely the way in it that it uh, worked and what it stood for. The first party era lasted from 1796 to 1824. 
It was dominated by the competition between the Federalists, represented by people like John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, versus the Democratic Republicans, represented by people like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. The main issues were federal government versus states' rights uh, competition, expansion westward, and the question of the expansion of the suffrage, uh, making more people uh, eligible to vote. The transformation came with the Jackson versus Quincy Adams election of 1824, the massive expansion of suffrage to include all adult white males. Ironically, this era has been called the era of nice feelings, but it was nothing like that. Uh, indeed, they were more up to kill each other at the highest levels back then. As this documentary uh, scene points out about the uh, Alexander Hamilton and Burr uh, duel. They measured the distance, 10 full paces. They cast lots for the choice of position. They then proceeded to load the pistols in each other's presence. Once Hamilton and Burr had loaded pistols in hand, the rules mandated that they take up positions 20 feet apart. When the signal was given, they had three seconds to fire. It was at this point that the two seconds gave completely different accounts of Hamilton's actions. According to Judge Pendleton, Hamilton had made a fateful decision that it would be morally wrong to shoot at Burr. He had made up his mind not to fire at Burr, but to fire in the air. The next part here was the second one, from 1828 to 1854. It was dominated by the Democratic Party, built on the machine of Jackson, versus weaker Whigs, uh, led by people like Henry Clay and Daniel Webster. The main issues were federalism again versus state rights, the increasing competition economic between the North and the South, and the untended question of the expansion of slavery to the West. The transformation was the 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act and the decision of Southern states to secede. The third era is the 1858-1896 part era, dominated by the rise of the Republicans who replaced the Whigs, uh, who also dominated the presidency in this era, versus the Democrats. The main issues were the abolition of slavery, the civil war and its aftermath, and increasing class warfare. The transformation of this was the Depression of 1890s and the rise of the People's Party, one of the most powerful third parties to ever rise in American history. From 1896 to 1928, we have the Fourth Party era, again dominated by Republicans to so the Democrats get Woodrow Wilson as a president at some point. And the main issues are worker agitation, the rising uh, class warfare, and the questions that were attended with the rise of the United States of America to major power status, for example, its participation in the First World War, the Spanish-American War, and so on. The transformation of this era was the Great Depression of 1929 and the collapse of the old economic system. This led to the fifth era, from 1932 to 1964, and a complete change in how politics were done for the last 80 years. The Democrats dominated the presidency, the Republicans only got Dwight Eisenhower into it. The main issues were the New Deal and its aftermath, World War II and the Cold War. The transformation of this era came with the rise of the civil rights issue, uh, which challenged the historical alignment of the parties. There are debates whether this, uh, the, this era is currently going on or has already ended. The sixth era is generally seen from 1968 to the present and characterized by an even handed of power between Democrats and Republicans. The main issues were economic competitiveness and the rise of social issues and the cultural wars. In many ways, this hasn't changed. Even 9-11 didn't really change it since Americans were bipartisan in their support for the war of terror. Is it transforming? Was it transformed by Trump's presidency or Obama's presidency? Political scientists have not agreed on that yet. Again, the same issues are still 
active here, economic comp competitiveness, and this also touches things like in, in, in inequality and social issues. And in America, climate change is much more of a social issue than an actual pragmatic issue, since people have ideological priors on whether they believe in it or not. How will this era transform? That's a good question. Maybe a second Trump presidency might transform it. Maybe the Democratic Party will collapse under the weight of its diversity. Maybe the Republican Party will split. Or maybe a new issue will arise, the fall of American great power status that might change it. But we don't know. This is what your generation will decide. You will be the, build the new party era if there is to be one. Nevada has its own history of party systems. The first party system was from the time of the state foundation to the 1890s, from 1864 to 1890. The Republican Party dominated. Uh, then from 1892 to 1906, you had the populist Silver Party dominating. Then from 1908 to 1932, you had a competitive era where neither party dominated, neither Democ uh, Democrats nor Republicans. Then from 1932 to 1980s, you had a Democratic Party domination. From the 1980s to today, you still you are again in a competitive era. Nevadans tended to split the ticket, voting for one party for some positions, the other for others. And they have a good record on voting for winners of uh, presidential elections. So having covered parties, we can finally come to elections. And here is the elections and their role in our system. The most important point you need to understand about elections is that elections are a non-violent means for making decisions of who gets what and how and getting political change. Also, they're an alternative to market systems. Social scientists and people, of course, disagree in what elections are supposed to do and how well they do them, but generally speaking, there is some agreement that elections are supposed to help us select our leaders. Well, the only thing that the elections guarantee is that the most popular will win, not necessarily the most competent or organized. So getting popularity is something that requires some competence. What about policy directions? As elections permitting citizens to set the policy of the state. Separation of powers dilutes this, so it can happen, and generally speaking, policy does follow the majority opinion as expressed in elections, even if it does not mean big policy changes. Some argue that electoral politics permit uh, citizens to develop virtues, to be good citizens, to be uh, good members of the community, and there is a finding that voting does foster feelings of political efficacy and thus is a war against political apathy. Those who vote are more likely to participate in all elements of politics, including civil society groups, interest groups, parties, and so on. Do elections, some argue elections are a way to inform the public and educate them, and yes, campaigns, electoral campaigns, do a good job of making us aware of issues and positions. Some argue that elections play an important role in, in containing conflict and averting a violent breakdown of legitimate authority. And yes, democracies tend to see less violence in politics than authoritarian regimes. And some argue that elections permit to legitimate uh, the political system of democracy and provide system stability. And it's true that on general, statistically speaking, democracies with a GDP per capita of more than $10,000 tend to not suffer from authoritarian challenges. So elections do a lot of things and they work, but they're not perfect, of course. That's why in ancient Greece, as I pointed out in a previous lecture, they preferred sortition for a lot of these decisions. Who has the right to vote? The US Constitution covers the right to vote in a number of sections and articles and a large number of amendments. Uh, Article one, section one, the 14th, 15th, 17th, 19th, 20th, 24th, and 26th amendments all cover the right to vote. Essentially, according to the U.S. Constitution, whoever is above the age of 18 and has the right to vote in the elections of the largest in size of the state legislators has the right to vote. So if you have the right to vote for a legislative body and you're over the age of 18, you can vote in federal elections. Under Article 4 and Article under Article 1, Section 4 and Section 5, states manage elections under the oversight of Congress. The Nevada Constitution gives a good idea on how state uh, constitutions and states try to manage the 
uh, right to vote. They, it has a much more expensive coverage of the right to vote. Article 2 of the Constitution of Nevada is about the right to suffrage and includes 10 sections and essentially lays down who can elect or be elected. Pretty much as US citizens, at least 18 years of age, resident in the state for at least for six months. So this part of the Constitution is unenforceable to, to a 1972 Supreme Court decision, and at least for 30 days in county or district preceding any election. So essentially, if you're a resident for 30 days, you can vote. Uh, Section 2 covers residency status for various protected groups uh, that might have to work out of state very often. Electors are given immunity from civil processes on general election day. Um, then the Article 2, Section A, 1A covers the rights of voters. And also Nevada has a right to recall of public officers. 25% of the people who voted for the office in the last election called for it, it happens. And then there's limits to campaign contributions for state elections. Per person, physical or artificial, 5,000 USD for primary, 5,000 USD for election, 5,000 USD for questions of referenda. They're not perfect because not everybody votes. And they're not perfect because voting is not the same thing as random sampling. Older people vote more than younger people. That's why America still has policies that are in the interest of retirees and older people and not in the interest of you guys. Women vote more than men. They have to fight very hard to get the right to vote, so they'll very well will implement them. Wealthier people more vote more than poor people because they got money and thus time. And that's why politics tends to support the ideas of the wealthy and protect the power of the wealthy rather than lead to redistribution of wealth. And whites vote more than racial minorities. Now, the Obama presidency may have signaled a change to this, but in generally, while numbers have increased, whites still vote much more than minorities. Maybe this is why the United States tends to be a white culture, whatever that means, country. Do not vote, present various uh, arguments for that. Uh, anarchists historically have said that if elections could change anything, they will be outlawed. Uh, one is legal obstacles like registration and days of election. The United States of America has its election day on a work day, which makes it very hard for people who cannot afford to take a day off or whose bosses are not willing to give them hours off to go and vote. In most other civilized parts of the world, elections are a holiday, uh, indeed a fiesta for the people to celebrate democracy. Added to changes, being 18 or 20 in the 1960s makes you less likely to vote so you were, as you were uh, infected by the countercultural and anti-establishment ideology of the era. Changes in voter mobilization strategy. Parties stopped using less face-to-face, -face, uh, stopped using face-to-face -face mobilization where they would actually send party members to walk through neighborhoods and knock on doors and introduce themselves and tell you about their party program. Uh, this tended to lead to high levels of mobilization. This has gone now, so there's a lot of self-selection on who goes to vote. Uh, there's a more mobile electorate, less ties to local issues, so less interest for local elections. And what vote cannot change things, so it's not rational to vote. Voting makes sense as a collective exercise. It makes sense as a kind of communion if you're in a religion. Your one vote is very unlikely to change things. The statistical chance of your one vote determining an election is actually lesser than the, I don't know, some black hole changing gravity and coming to our planet and destroying us all. However, participating in elections has an important impact on those things that we talked before, legitimacy of the system, and in persuading everybody that's worth voting. Your one vote is not important about winning an election. Your one vote is important about persuading others to vote. So then as a collective, as a people, as we the people, your vote then has an impact. And it is simply a lie to say that elections do not lead to big changes. They do. Andrew Jackson's 1828 victory led to a massive expansion of political participation that made it irreversible in a way that political participation will increase further and further. FDR Roosevelt's victory in 1933 led to the New Deal and massive changes in how the US economy and society operate. In England, Clement Attlee's 1945 victory led to the nationalization of big parts of the UK economy, and then Margaret Thatcher's 1979 victory led to the reversal of Attlee's policy. Elections work.
Okay, they work, but not exactly as this creepy, trying to be 1950s chauvinist, patriarchal, kind of classist, racist advertisement made in the 1990s or 2000s, trying to get people out of vote. Why would they think that this is a good idea? You watch the clip and you tell me. Voting changes the world, literally. Tired of that boring old water, Johnny? Well, why don't you vote for something new? Chocolate milk sure is better than water, isn't it, Johnny? Here's Dad. Tired of having that same old wife do all the cooking and cleaning? Mm-hmm. Looks like Father Time has slapped her around a little. Maybe you should give voting a try. Mmm. Three wives is better than one, isn't it, Dad? Hey there, Susie. Tired of all those homeless people cluttering up your streets and gutters? Try handing them a voter registration card. There. That's better. Now he smells dandy. When you're looking to change the world, don't forget to vote. How does the voter decide? Well, uh, social scientists have identified a number of uh, factors that lead to the decision to vote for one party or another, or one candidate or another. Uh, party identification, people will vote for parties with which they identify uh, politically, uh, ideologically. Gender affects voting decisions. Race affects voting decisions. Ethnicity affects voting decisions. Prospective voting, vote is, some voters vote based on careful consideration of consequences of the vote in the future. They are the minority. The majority of voters vote based on retrospective voting, voting based on reaction to the past and present, essentially the state of the economy in the last six months. And finally, personal views of the candidate as an individual. Uh, during the Bush versus Al Gore election, the classical example was people saying we voted for Bush because we thought we could drink a beer with him. Nevada has more, more forms of elections that are not existent in the federal level. There are initiatives, referendums, and recalls, or elements of participatory democracies. Initiatives force the legislature to make law, essentially the citizens come together and force the legislature to make a certain law. Uh, but this provides a lot of power to the legislature who can amend, repeal, and etc. any law made as an initiative. Referendums are much more powerful. They make directly law. They put something directly to the statutes. And that cannot be tampered by the legislature, but only repealed by another referendum if it's done by petition. If it's called the referendum by the legislature, then the legislature has the right to tamper with it later on. And finally, Nevada also has recalls. If people are unhappy with a member of the, the elected bodies in the state, they can trigger a recall election where they try to remove them. Also, Nevada has a couple of unique elements into its elections compared to other places in the United States. It has a none of the above candidates option. The Republican Party tried to get rid of it but got nowhere. Uh, doesn't really affect who gets to win, since none of the above is not a person, cannot win an election, but can be used as a general measure of the satisfaction of the people with the system. And also Nevada is, uh, requires it mandatory to register in order to vote. You cannot do same day registration. So let's say you wanna be the president. What's the process? Well, first you need to be nominated. Back in the day, some cigar smoking, politically powerful people will nominate you. Nowadays, the primary is the most important method for nomination. In another name, the party base, we the people, nominates you. To get to the primary though, you have to persuade people that you are a legitimate candidate. First, there is an invisible primary to gauge possible financial, media, and political support. You don't officially declare your candidacy, but you know, you leave rumors, stories, Try to see how people, especially in the party, would uh, react to you running for office. If you find enough early support, then you file with the 
Federal Election Commission and start exploring if you can raise enough support to win. Technically, from this point on, you are actually running for the office, but you don't have to officially announce it. Instead, you still explore if you can raise enough money and support to win. You raise money and you start building a media profile as a credible candidate, getting friendly stories that present you as a statesperson. Finally, once you feel secure enough, you officially announce your candidacy nationwide so everybody knows you're running for the presidency. And then the Hunger Games begin as you try to get the nomination of one of the two parties, preferably the party in which you've built your character. And this is a bloody fight, as there are usually much more many candidates for the position of nominated candidate of a party than there are for the actual presidential election. So you got to defeat everybody else and persuade the party based that you are their person, but also have an eye to winning the moderate vote during the election. The process works as this. You first have local party caucuses, which have very little participation usually. Those local party caucuses make decisions of who the local party thinks is the best candidate. Then they send a representatives to the state caucus, where they also meet with important state-level party officials and elected state-level uh, party members. That is very powerful. The state caucus makes a decision uh, on who to support, and they send delegates to the primaries, uh, or they organize primaries uh, at the state level. The primaries then have the elections between the various candidates, and the winner of those uh, elections is then declared the national candidate of the party in the national convention. Primaries can take three forms. Some are open, anybody can vote, whether Democrat, Republican or Independent. Some are closed, only registered party members can vote, only Democrats or Republicans, no Independents. Some are semi-open, they permit Independents to vote as well as registered party members. Some are proportional with uh, delegates being awarded to candidates based on the number of votes they get. So even candidates who don't get the majority might have a chance to win the candidacy. Smart votes are first past the posts. Some even let delegates decide, and some councillors decide by non-electoral means. There's diversity on this. Who wins primaries? The person with the biggest war chest. Incumbents in office, governors, vice presidents, and presidents and front runners who maintain momentum through some social scientists disagree on this. Once you win the primary, it's time for the party to come together after the acrimonious infighting and declare you the united candidate of the party in the national convention. So this is the final phase. The winner of most primaries is usually declared candidate. They choose a vice president of the convention. The convention is a media fiesta to show the unity and energy of the party and essentially mend up any bad feelings from the primary competitions. Once you get the convention's national candidacy, you are the candidate, the official candidate for presidency of that party, and you can start worrying about the general election. Nevada has an interesting history when it comes to conventions, national conventions and presidential primaries. Historically, both Democrats and Republicans prefer choosing delegates in closed party meetings. An attempt at the legislature mandated primary process failed, as did an attempt by the grand old party, the Republican Party, to try mail in voting. The general election is all about swing voters, who are not actually mostly independents. They're actually mostly members of one or the other party who are apathetic. Uh, and they're not as clueless as this funny skit tries to make them look. Oaks. When is the election? How soon do we have to decide? What are the names of the two people running? And be specific. Who is the president right now? Is he or she running? Because if so, experience is maybe something we should consider. How long is a president's term of office? One year? Two years? Three years? Or life? The goal in the general election is not so much to win national votes, the majority of the voters, as electoral votes, the majority of the electoral college. As we said, the Electoral College is an ad hoc institution that only exists every four years in the United States of America. And it was created by the framers of the Constitution because they wanted to check the popular will. They didn't want the president to be elected by the people directly because they felt that will make the president too uh, beholden to the will of the people. 
The give space states more power than small states, but gives small states more representation. Each state gets as many electors as its collective number of congresspersons, senators, and House of Representatives. So Alaska, for example, that gets only one House of Representative vote actually has three electors because it also gets two senators. Electors are activist members of parties. They are expected to vote as the popular vote in their state went, but they're not required to do so, which leads us to fears of faithless electors. But that has never happened because if you do that, you're done. You're done in your community. You're done in the local party. You probably have to move away from where you live. Okay? So the winner of the presidential election is the one who vote, wins the most electoral votes which essentially means whoever wins the biggest states. But because the biggest states usually are divided, California and Texas have different ideas, that actually permits some smaller states to have some swing vote effect. And it also means that you could win the election without actually having won the majority of the votes of the people, as long as you were strategic on which, votes you, on which electoral votes you sought. This has led to criticisms. The winner is the person who wins more states, not more votes. The faithless electors point that I said in the past. And the biggest problem is that candidates focus all of their energy on a small number of big states rather than all of the United States of America. They don't care about Alaska. They don't care about Maine. They don't care about New Hampshire. They just care about California. They don't care about Nevada. Okay, Nevada has what? Seven electors. Mm. They care about California, Texas, Illinois, Georgia, them people. That's the biggest problem here, that it essentially motivates candidates to just focus on the states that are swing states in electoral votes and then the big states that provide the big parts and ignore medium sized and smaller states. So that's running. A, that's how you win the election. How do you run a campaign? You need a good professional staff, which means you have to persuade very competent people to leave their jobs to come and work for you. And then you have to reward those people when you become president. You need thick skin and deeply hidden closets due to oppo research. The opposition will research on you. And they will find out that website you frequented, that video you watched, and they will use it against you. So you either need thick skin or you better hide your stuff very well using VPN and multiple other things. You need to make voters focus on balance issues and your choice and position issues which majority support. Balance issues are issues where everybody likes in a way, while position issues are issues where people are divided. But, you know, there's always a majority and a minority in there. And you want to make sure people focus on those issues, those position issues, where you hold a position similar to that of the majority. And balance issues more explicitly mean those issues where you have, uh, yeah, but there's a broad amount of consensus among voters. So, you know, it's cool to focus on those issues because nobody's going to hate you. Uh, you need to use wedge issues to divide the other side. You want to find issues on which the other side's so potential supporters are divided and bring them to the fore and force them on that. Uh, this was, for example, done against Obama by bringing to the fore his relationship with more radical uh, members within the black community in the hopes of turning uh, liberal moderates that used to vote for Clinton against him. That's a classical wedge issue. Then you got to get voters and media to focus on the issues in which your side has its ownership, on which your side people believe is better. In the past, Republicans were considered better on issues of law and order and uh, national foreign policy while Democrats were considered better on issues of poverty alleviation, racial issues, diversity, and education. So you want the, part, the media to focus on those issues in which already people are primed to think, do you know what, a Republican president or a Democratic president will be better for this. And of course, negative campaigns. And I'm leaving you in this lecture with a collection of some of the nasty negative campaigns from past elections. Enjoy them.
After gambling your money on his failed stimulus, President Obama says, Don't blow a bunch of cash on Vegas. Vegas. He doesn't get it. In Nevada, tourism means jobs. Under Obama, nearly 62,000 fewer Nevada jobs. Our home values, gone. America's worst recovery and a new recession could mean more jobs lost. But as Nevada struggles, Obama says, Don't blow a bunch of cash on Vegas. Vegas. Crossroads GPS is responsible for the content of this advertising. I don't know that I can say it on television. It's not PG. <laughs> clueless. Uninformed. Uninformed. Extreme. Ultra conservative. Scary. Silly. Out of touch. Scary. Different. I didn't want to say what I was thinking. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Back in the 50s. Extreme. Neanderthal. I just don't think Todd Aiken understands what's going on in America right now. I'm Claire McCaskill, and I approve this message. First came the news. The pro-life supporter had an affair with a patient a decade ago, and after learning she was pregnant, urged her to have an abortion. And now? Tennessee's oldest and largest conservative organization is mounting a campaign to force the resignation of Representative Scott Desjardins. Desjardins is not only a hypocrite, but a fraud. He should resign his seat and quit his campaign. House Majority PAC is responsible for the content of this advertising. I'm Bill Nelson, and I approve this message. With a history of bar brawls, altercations, and road rage, a trail of unpaid debts and tax liens, one of the worst attendance records in Congress this year, while still taking his $174,000 salary, and a plan that could cut trillions from Medicare, Social Security, and defense. No wonder Florida's newspapers have said Connie Mack IV is in no way qualified to be a senator and has no business holding any elected office. I'm Todd Aiken, and I approve this message. It's a corrupt Washington game, and Claire McCaskill plays it, getting rich off government. McCaskill cut funding for education and veterans, but partnerships owned by McCaskill's family received over a million dollars in stimulus spending. Now a new scandal. McCaskill's family pocketed 40 million in federal subsidies. 40 million of our money. Corrupt Claire, the moment her hand came off the Bible, it went into our pockets. Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez tramples on basic human rights and silences critical media. He's also said, if I was from the United States, I'd vote for Obama. Russia's Vladimir Putin supplies weapons to terrorists, supports Iran's nuclear ambitions, and calls President Obama an honest man who really wants to change much for the better. Even Fidel Castro once called Obama the most progressive candidate to the U.S. presidency. Chavez, Putin, Castro, Obama secured the dictator vote. Does he have yours? Campaign for American Values PAC is responsible for the content of this advertising. I'm Tammy Baldwin, and I approve this message. This is uranium. Iran needs it to build a nuclear bomb. It's now been revealed Tommy Thompson invested in a company that partnered with Iran to mine for uranium. And he invested in another company that's building Iran's nuclear reactor. And Tommy's DC lobbying firm, they worked for a big oil company to weaken sanctions against Iran. Now Tommy Thompson's attacking Tammy Baldwin's patriotism? He's not for you anymore. What do we really know about Syed Taj? We know he relies on political support and funding from the Democratic Socialists of America. We know his extremist contributors include the Council for American Islamic Relations, named as an unindicted co-conspirator in funding the terrorist group Hamas. And we know Syed Taj wants to advance Muslim power in America. Syed Taj, too extreme for Michigan, too extreme for America. Freedom's Defense Fund is responsible for the content of this advertising. I don't think Mitt Romney understands what he's done to people's lives by closing the plant. I don't think he realizes that, that people's lives completely changed. When Mitt Romney and Bain closed the plant, I lost my health care. And my family lost their health care. And uh, uh, a short time after that, my wife became ill. I don't know how long she was sick. Uh, and I think maybe she didn't say anything because she knew that we, we couldn't afford the insurance. And, and then one day she, she uh, became ill and, and I took her up to the Jackson County Hospital 
and, and, and admitted her for pneumonia, and that's when they found the cancer. And by then, it was stage four. It was, it was, there was nothing they could do for her. And she passed away in 22 days. I do not think Mitt Romney realizes what he's done to anyone. And I, furthermore, I do not think Mitt Romney is concerned. Priorities USA Action is responsible for the content of this advertising. I'm Mary Bono Mac, and I approve this message. Thanksgiving is a wonderful holiday, not for Raul Ruiz. For six years, Ruiz led protests attacking Thanksgiving and our American values. At one protest filled with anti-American and pro-Palestinian agitators, a statement was read from cop killer Momia Abu Jamal calling Thanksgiving a holocaust. Another protest turned violent and Ruiz was arrested. It's outrageous Ruiz is running for Congress.